Welcome to Freshly Grounded, guys. This episode, one of the reasons this episode was made possible uh, was because of the hard work of the people at One Umar, which is a, a charity uh, based in the UK with a 100% donation policy. Uh, these guys work on food, water and sanitization projects, education, medical aid, uh, shelter uh, and orphans around the world. Um, and uh, they are the charity that I have been working with uh, Mufti Munir over here in the UK uh, to do this tour and because of their generosity they were able to help us out and, and make this uh, episode happen um, so a big thank you to One Umar again like I say they're a 100% uh, donation policy charity and you can donate uh, your sadaqa there uh, by going to One Umar that's O-N-E-U-M-M-A-H dot org dot UK uh, also check them out on Instagram which is at if you bear with me I'll let you know uh, one on my charity, that's O-N-E-U-M-M-A-H, charity, uh, one on my charity. Guys, support them, let them know we sent you, and like I said, a big thanks uh, to those guys. This episode is with uh, Mufti Muhammad Ibn Munir. Uh, we've had him on the podcast before, and uh, it was an episode that was loved, and um, uh, I think one that people really wanted kind of... Uh, him to come back uh, we discussed many uh, specific issues in the last episode stuff like watching MMA and UFC stuff like working in a barber shop or uh, earning haram uh, income in this episode we went a lot more general so we discussed kind of the idea of sinning and then repenting again and then sinning and repenting again uh, we discussed um kind of Yom Qiyama, um, the afterlife, uh, Juz Amma, um, just a, a bunch of kind of uh, general scenarios uh, that I think that will be uh, beneficial for all of us to hear. Uh, we thank the Sheikh for coming down and for spending time with us again uh, for a second time. Um, as you guys know, I am kind of technically on paternity leave right now. And so we shot a few of these episodes in advance uh, so that I could kind of take some time off. So this is one of those episodes that we shot um, some weeks back. And um, we, like I said, thank you so much to the Sheikh and to Wan Umar for helping make this happen. And uh, that's it. Enjoy the episode, guys, with uh, Mufti Muhammad Ibn Munir. And welcome to Freshly Grounded, the brand new podcast by best friends Faisal and Sam. Huh? I, welcome, I said, welcome to Freshly Grounded. The, no, after that bit. The brand new podcast. And after that bit? But best friends, face with Sam. Really? This coffee's good, yeah? Yeah, it should be. It's an espresso. Yeah, I'm doing that. You have an es- do you use an espresso coffee normally? Sometimes I do. I'm doing yeah. that. Mm-hmm. I like the beans too. Okay. Chocolate covered sometimes. The chocolate covered beans? As in to, to eat them? Espresso, oh yeah. You can give you a little, you know, every yeah. now and then. Not, <laughs> not, not every day, but, you know, sometimes. Alhamdulillah. Mm-hmm. So, uh, do you often drink coffee? Um, To be honest, no. No? Uh, you know, everyone knows I'm a tea man, a okay. tea disciple, a disciple of the leaf. Fine. But the bean is respected and loved. Okay. <laughs> it's more of mood. Right. Or if I'm a guest and they're like, you know, big on coffee. Or sometimes in which I want the immediate effect of the coffee. Fine. Different type of caffeine. That's not me now. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You have, you know, some types of teas have uh, equal or even higher amount in caffeine than, than, than the coffee bean. Mm-hmm. But I feel that it has a different effect on me. Coffee just gives me more of a jolt sometimes than other types of teas. That's probably because perhaps if you don't have coffee too often, you can get that buzz from it. There you go. There you go. Mm-hmm. Sheikh, could I just ask you to perhaps just um, move your mic to where it's like directly in front of your... Yeah, okay, yeah, right, the arm. Cause it's, yeah, because it's quite like a directional It's mic. better? Yeah, that's a lot better. Just like Thank you. Um, Sheikh, this is your second time on Freshly Grounded. The first time I... Um, you were kind of going in blind with it, right? Like you didn't necessarily, you, you put your trust in us. Perhaps you put your trust in the brothers and the brothers put their trust in us. Um, h- how did you find that? How was, uh, how was that being on Freshly Grounded before? The experience? Yep. It was nice. I enjoyed it. Um, I thought it was very thought-provoking. Uh, I thought it was uh, invigorating, the conversation, that it was casual. It was freshly grounded, simple, nothing scripted. But at the same time, I believe it was purposeful. And it had an aim and an objective. It, it had a, a clear direction to it. So whenever you can like mix two different styles like that, uh, traditional, uh, orthodox, conventional with unorthodox, unconventional, I think it's going to be more powerful. So uh, I liked it. I enjoyed it. Um, and I feel it was just natural. We're just talking, you know. And um, obviously you see how different people take it. Mm-hmm. Somebody watches the podcast and it's a benefit, tremendous benefit. Another person is his misery 
or a third person says, bring such and such, or bring a third, or bring a fourth. And I, you know, as we say to keep it real, I think everyone reads the comments on YouTube. Yeah. People say, I didn't read the comments. Everyone is reading the comments. Mm -hmm. You understand what I'm saying mm -hmm. to you? And that's why you, you, whenever you watch certain videos, you, you're going through the comments, says, who's here reading the comments? Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. You understand what I'm saying to you? So I read some of the comments, and you find just, you know, such different and contrast comments and views of different people, but it goes to show you that it was effective. Good or for bad, but it... it it, it meant something. It, sure. it left some type of mark. I, I enjoyed myself, and I think it was of some benefit. And uh, I appreciate that you invited me a second time. You hosted me a second time. May Lord bless you for that. Mm -hmm. And I say this all the time. Um, brothers, they say thank you for coming, but in actuality, it's an honor for me. Oh. And you're doing us a service. Uh, it was once, and obviously it's not a lecture, but just a random benefit that came up. Uh, it was uh, Sheikh Sa'di, rahimahullah, who's known many of his books have been translated. Uh, once he said to his students, after his students had brought him a bunch of questions, and his students were like apologizing, like, why did you, you know, we're sorry, Sheikh, for all of these questions. We're sorry, we're sorry, we're sorry. And Sheikh Saadi, rahimahullah, he says, Nahnu, he says, Memnunun bikurni ma ta'tunana min al mashakil. Okay, my call. He says, We are blessed. We're fortunate. We're lucky for all of the problems that you bring us. The, the questions that you bring us, it's not bothering us or harming us. You're actually giving us an opportunity for good deeds, mm -hmm. to do some type of service. So that's my attitude. Any platform, any masjid, they thank the sheikh for coming. He didn't have to. But in actuality, <clears throat> I should be thanking. And it's an honor because it's a means of hopefully spreading something which is a, a benefit. Inshallah. So, you know, may Allah bless you. And this is for everyone. I always, This is always my policy, you know. Jazakallah mm khair, -hmm. sheikh. Um, I, I, the... the um, we definitely are uh, grateful to you, as I mentioned, for coming back. Um, as, as you mentioned, we, we kind of like to talk here on topics that we feel perhaps um, our audience or relate to our audience kind of here and now. And so as I was driving in um, this evening to, to do this episode, a, a, as you mentioned, the episode is always unscripted. I was thinking about what kind of issues people like myself or um, our audience go through on a daily basis uh, so that we can perhaps try and tackle it in conversation. Mm -hmm. And so I thought it was something very, very general and something that you've discussed very often, but something that we can always do with hearing about. And that's this idea of uh, well, sinning, right? Because we, cause we're all sinners. How can a person, what's the state of a person who sins, makes tawbah, repeats the sin, makes tawbah, repeats the sin, makes tawbah? What's the state of that person? Is their tawbah accepted? And how can they then break that cycle um, and can they can they you know say that their toba is being accepted if they if they keep returning to that sin? Crystal clear, crystal clear. Very important question. Um, many people they've brought up this question before. I think the answer can be found, or we can get on the road of answering the question accurately through two Quranic verses. Uh, one is from the second chapter of Surah Al-Baqarah, and the third is from the seventeenth chapter Surah Al-Isra. Allah says in Surah Al-Baqarah, "Inna Allah yuhibbu tawabin." Was translated to mean that Allah loves, Allah loveth at tawabin And he loves al mutatahirin And al mutatahir we're going to get to the tawab, is someone who purifies or cleanses or cleans him or herself after some type of defilement. One is tahir, tahirin, someone who's naturally pure, right? And then there's one who's mutatahir. And in the Arabic language, tafa'ala, has a different usage than fa'ala or fa'ala or istaf'ala, etc. in sarf morphology. So mutatahir is someone that is attempting cleanliness after some type of defilement, relatively. And at tawab also is fa'al, and that is known as sigatul mubalagha or al istikthar. So Allah says at tawabin, and it is in Allah yuhibbu ta'ibin, which will literally be translated as repentance, mm -hmm. those who repent. But it, it, it is linguistically uh, is broken out to tawabin, those who make abundant repentance. Repentance, after repentance, after repentance, tawab is different than ta'ibin. All right? Surah Al-Isra, Allah Azza wa Jal, he says, إِن تَكُونُ صَالِحِينَ فَإِنَّهُ كَانَ لِلْأَوَّابِينَ غَفُورًا Allah says, رَبُّكُمْ أَعْلَمُ بِمَا فِي نُفُوسِكُمْ Your Lord knows within your souls more than anyone else. أَعْلَمُ بِمَا فِي نُفُوسِكُمْ What you think about? What you fear, Allah knows this more than we know it ourselves. Allah says, "In takunu salihin, and if you are righteous, fa innu kana lil awabina ghafuran, 
Then Allah is ghafoor or forgiving for the awwabin. And you see the similarity in the style. Tawwabin and awwabin. All right? And it isn't necessarily a person just goes back, but awwab, meaning it's awbatan ba'da awbatan ba'da awba. Tawbatan ba'da, tawbatan ba'da, tawbatan. And there are other verses as well, such as Surah Tawbah, the talk of Ibrahim, uh, uh, and, and other ayat in which these styles are used. al muhim those are just two that just came to my mind random, randomly. The point is, is that uh, some of the ulama of Islam, they say is that a person who's tawab obviously is making tawbah for something. Sure. So that means that he made tawbah, he fell into a sin, and he repeated the tawbah. And he's constantly repeating the process. And it is an eternal and a perpetual struggle of sin, cleaning, washing, etc. So let's just look at ourselves on a daily basis. When's the last time you took a shower? When's the last time you took a bath? When's the last time a person's washed up? In the West, and also in the East, of course, because we know that's the foundation for much of Western civilization, all right? But we're talking about where we live today. Shower is like nothing. Hot shower, you can take a 30-minute shower, hour shower. You can scrub and rub in the bathtub as long as you want. Hot water, things are so limitless. Soap, shampoo, body wash, bath crystals. But why are you constantly making a shower except because you went to sleep, except because you were running and jogging, you started sweating and perspiring, you got dirty, so now it's time to wash again. And a person who takes two showers a day, three times a day is not considered a dirty person. But you keep constantly what? Cleaning yourself. Mm -hmm. So the concept of you clean yourself when there's a need. Rather, you maintain your cleanliness by constantly making toba. So one who doesn't fall into sins but so often, he's going to have to constantly make toba. And one who tries to do the right thing, is striving to do the right thing, but he slips up, he gets right back up and right back into the race. And the uh, Japanese, they say in an ancient proverb, if you fall seven times, get up eight times. That's simple. If you fall seven times, you get up eight times, meaning you keep trying. But of course, it doesn't mean that you don't pay attention to how you fell. You have to make an attempt to avoid it in the future, yes. And you have to learn from the previous mistakes, of course. But humans are going to be humans. So a person can know how he's fallen into this addiction, or how depression comes to me, or the signs of this sin, or this lust, or this desire, and he fights. But he just slips. He makes a mistake. He gets dirty again. So it's better for him to make the toba again, instead of just saying, I can't keep making it because I'm being hypocritical. And this is, uh, in my humble opinion, one of the... Uh, one of the worst tricks and slights of shaitan is that he gets the servant to lose hope from toba because you're just going to do it again. Mm. We know, we both know you're going to do it again. What's the point of you making toba? Your toba is toba of munafiq, toba to kathib. And some of that may be true of people who make toba and they aren't sincere. But we're talking about someone who is sincere and really does feel bad. And they have the regret, they have the remorse, but they just slip. It's hard for me to leave it alone. So I think there has to be a balance between uh, preventative measures and between just, you know, damage control. We try not to get hit, but once we get hit, we get right back into it. But speaking about the shaitan and speaking about um, having that balance, uh, let's say a person commits a sin and then they feel, you know, awful about it. They make the toba and they still continue to feel really bad about it and they feel almost, they're almost going into depression about it. Where do they find the balance of knowing that, because in a way, having that feeling is good because it shows that you have a sound heart, right? To, to, to show that you, you genuinely feel horrible about that sin. Mm -hmm. But then on the other end, if you continue to just bathe in that d depression, you're, you know, appealing to the shaitan. So... Uh, at, at what point are you meant to say this is good for me or, or, or it's bad for me? And how do you get that balance then? Crystal clear. This is something that the scholars of Islam have mentioned. Uh, they have stated that from the conditions of a valid toba is regret, remorse, a nedim. And they base this off of some prophetic narrations in which there has to be regret. However, they say that this regret, la yasilu ila haddil yes. It cannot go to the level of despair. And in which you're dwelling and totally, absolutely focused on, oh man, how did I, how did I, I drunk alcohol all of those years, all of those years out of my life, I was disobedient to Allah, and you just drown and wallow in it. It cannot reach that level. And if it reaches that level, then that is no longer what's meant by that condition. So that once more, there's a balance. And obviously, there's a thin line. Because from one aspect, you got to say, look, today's a new day. Kalas, that was done, that was over. I'm now a repentant, I've returned to Allah. It doesn't matter how I fell into it. But at the same time, that regret keeps you from 
relapsing. Mm-hmm. Because you say to yourself, well, this alcohol is really good. You know, I've been drinking it for such a long time. But how am I going to feel afterwards? I'm going to have that, that, that feeling of regret and remorse. I'm going to feel low. <sighs> I can't do it. And sometimes you have to retract and recall that thought and that feeling to avoid it. But it can't go to the extreme in which you can't move forward by doing righteousness. You can't go forward. So the scholars of Islam, they say, number one, you must have regret for the sin. And regret for the sin is manifested in you not laughing about it later on. And joking about it later on. And publicizing it and, and spreading it. Social media, for example. So some of the scholars of Islam, they say that if a person was extremely ill, extremely sick, a really bad car accident, they were in a coma, they were about to die, they were this close to, to death, and they had lost hope in living, and then miraculously, they came back to full strength. Allah cured them, their body, it recovered, the surgery went through, whatever the case may be. The scholars, they say, would a person sit back and laugh about it? Would you joke when you were in a coma for three months? Would it be a laughing thing? Would you publicize it? Would you show the people of the pictures of you in the hospital with those tubes coming out of your throat and your chest? Of course you wouldn't. The sheer thought of it will make your skin cringe mm-hmm. and the hair on the back of your neck stand up. So to say that is the thought and reflection of jahiliya, and the thought and the reflection of that ugliness of the sin. But at the same time, it doesn't mean that you live in the past and you become stuck in the past and you allow shaitan to just pick you off and just mow you down with the thoughts of the past because it's going to lead to clear depression. And it also may be a means of disrespect to Allah. And that is because Allah has told us, the Prophet has told us that he loves those who make tawbah. The Prophet ﷺ has informed us, Lallahu ashaddu farahan, that Allah is more happier when a servant repents to him than a man who's lost in the desert. And he loses all of his possessions, all of his resources. He is stuck and he is given up and the camel comes back with the provisions. How happy would that man be? Mm. Over the moon. Of, of course. And Allah, in a, a, a manner that suits and befits his greatness and his majesty, is even happier. So how can you enjoy that status and you're just dwelling on the past and the sin that you made. It doesn't mix water and oil. So there's a balance. Summarizing it, there has to be regret. Uh, the regret is also a means of preventative measures in the future. Think about how you're going to feel and how you were just re- regretful. But that cannot reach the level in which you despair and give up. Last but not least, it cannot be a means in which it dominates your time and your mind. And you keep thinking about what I did, what I did, how miserable and how horrible of a person I am. Rather, Allah loves you when you make toba. And the Prophet informs us that if we didn't make sin, Allah would bring a new people who make sin, seek his forgiveness, and he would forgive them. Just, just think about that narration now. You making a sin, and that sin being something that's, that you fell into... It's wisdom in that. And that is it manifests your need of Allah. And just think about how many Muslims who aren't that religious, unfortunately, that we have to use that term, or they aren't really the most practicing Muslims, they have a stereotype against religious people. Overseas, inside, called mutawa. Mm-hmm. If you have a beard, you're mutawa. A short thobe, mutawa. Kufi on your head, mutawa. And oftentimes, they expect the mutawa to be extremely judgmental. No joke, you can't even smile. It's haram to smile. Everything is haram. Everyone's going to the hellfire. It's the stereotypes. These are the stereotypes that many people have. Okay? Uh, But where does this stereotype come from? Oftentimes, it comes from a person feeling that they're perfect because they don't make sin. And the arrogance could possibly creep up on you. But the fact that every now and then you fall and you trip, you say, whoa, I'm not that good of a skater. I'm not that good. I'm pretty good, but every now and then you have to fall. Every, obviously it's football season in America right now, American football. Okay. Every good quarterback, every now and then has to throw an interception. And oftentimes it does what? It grounds him. I'm good, but I'm not perfect. And now I'm going to try even harder with the next completion and the next touchdown pass. But if you never, ever, ever throw an interception, you may possibly, your head may rise up like a hot air balloon. So the, the toba and the sin, it oftentimes does what? It levels you. Based off of that narration. And that is for you to manifest your need towards Allah. Is that it's not about your righteousness. It's about Allah's tawfiq. His hidayah. That's it. And the things that you do are nothing more than your human efforts. But it's something deeper and greater than that. And oftentimes we forget this. And we feel that we're doing Allah a favor. We feel that we're helping out Allah by being righteous. And we have to be humbled from time to time. 
And that is why one of my favorite quotes uh, of the past is a wise man who says, who said we, we learn uh, little from victory and much from defeat. We learn little from victory, but much from defeat. Defeat humbles you and it gets you to recalibrate what you got to do in the future. But of course, that doesn't mean lose every battle, right? It doesn't mean that you go with the intention of losing. But if you do lose, get right back into it. Humble yourself and don't get stuck on the past. The past oftentimes is helpful and oftentimes it's destructive to the mind, being stuck in the past. You've made the toba, have good thoughts of Allah, make your intentions never to return back to it, which is another condition of toba, and move forward. Don't get stuck on what you did in the past. Speaking of people who stereotype um, or who can stereotype quote unquote practicing Muslims, I think there's a influx of that right now in our generation in that there's a lot of young Muslims who are starting to, or who have been uh, over the past decade, um, start practicing Islam, right? Um, mm -hmm. uh, and whether that's young Muslims who are, who are born in Muslim families or, or even reverts. Um, and they often, I know a lot of listeners who are listening to this podcast will be that person. They often have to deal with their family members, perhaps, even though they're Muslim, um, having those stereotypes of them. How can a person who has... Um, has had their kind of eyes and heart opened up to to the beauty of Islam. How can they give nasiha to their family? I know that's a very wide and generic question. Again, one that you probably be asked a lot. Um, but perhaps some practical steps: how they can speak to their brothers and sisters, how they can speak to their parents, um, or, or, or what they can do. I know that the, often people give the answer of you know um, your actions, and I, I'm not belittling that at all. But perhaps some practical steps that someone can take away by listening to this episode. Clear gentleness. Be gentle. Even if you tell someone to put a cigarette down or to put on a kimar, do it in a gentle manner. Unless it's someone that you have a relationship with and which you can talk to or they'll only respect when you really, you know, like, yo, fear Allah, little brother or older brother, fear Allah. I love you, Father, fear Allah. But if that's not the case, rifq, gentleness. Uh, we just mentioned in the masjid just now the narration of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, in the law rafiqun, you hibbul rifq. Wa yu'ti alayhi ma la yu'ti ala al-umf. That Allah, number one, is gentle. Yuhibbu rifq, and he loves gentleness. And Allah gives and allows things to take place through gentleness that would never take place through umf, harshness, or violence, or crudeness, or just being rigid. So oftentimes when we become enlightened, we become too harsh and too fast. And we forget about gentleness and uh, how gentle was Allah with you, first and foremost. Allah didn't destroy you in that. You, you walked out of the car accident in one piece. The bullet whizzed past your head or the knife, it only pierced your belly. It didn't go into your organs or puncture your lung in the club that night. And that's what shook you up and made you, I can't drink no more. I can't go to the club no more. This isn't right. That was a near-death experience. But just imagine if that blade was two inches over or an inch over and when it went through your lung, you would have been dead. But Allah was gentle with you. So now be gentle with the other sinful people in your family, your friends. So gentleness... Number one. Number two is wisdom, hikmah. You got to know what to say, when to say it, and how to say it, all right? Uh, the scholars of Islam, they have a, a, a very long discussion on what is wisdom, what's hikmah, what is the exact definition of hikmah. Uh, some of them, they say, such as Ibn Qayyim, he says, It's to do what's necessary, when it's necessary, and how it's necessary. That's what, that's what hikmah is. So I, this is wrong, but it's not the proper place to say it. It's not the proper place to say it. it. You don't have to say it in front of everyone. Or you shouldn't say it in public, but put a person on blast, depending on the situation. Okay, um, In this situation, this person, this relationship I have with them, I can't be gentle with them. I have to shake them up and scare them. So you have to use wisdom. Uh, and many people, oftentimes, many of us, we lack wisdom. We, don't, we, we know that it's correct to say it, but we don't know how to say it. All right. Another very practical step is a very controversial topic, and that is being judgmental. Many people have asked me, can we judge people in Islam? Is there such thing as you can't judge me, only God can judge me, right? In pop mm -hmm. culture, mm -hmm. many people, they say, have tattoos, all types of things like this. So, of course, you know, there are times in which, of course, a law judges. And also, humans judge as well. And there are other times in which only a law can judge, and you can't. Judge me. You don't know what's in my heart or what I've been through or what I'm going through. But the outward action is clearly impermissible. Clearly. You, you can't drink in Islam. I don't know what you went through. You may have been abused or may have went through traumatic things. I can't judge you. But drinking alcohol, I've judged. That's haram. 
but not always even to just be that type of judgmental person or confrontational person. And which sometimes you have to turn away. Sometimes you have to pick a better time. Sometimes you have to pick a time which a person is going to listen to you and avoid the confrontation, even though it's clearly haram. Just like people did it when you were sinning or you weren't doing the right thing. So oftentimes people, they have such a strong religious zeal, which is a good thing. It causes them to just be overzealous and they forget about these golden principles of gentleness, of wisdom, and of not always judging a person. Uh, and also relating to a person. And oftentimes people, they don't use the relationships that Allah has given them. Allah tells us about the prophets and the messengers. Look, man, the wise, he said to his son, Ya Bunaya. He didn't say, oh boy. He says, oh my boy. He used the closeness as a medium. My son, my brother, listen to me. You're my, we're blood. We share the same blood. Do you trust me? Do you think I will mislead you? Do you think I will tell you it's haram to do this and it's really not haram? You have, to, you have to use that, what Allah has made of relationship, okay? So many people, they have so much zeal that they forget about these golden principles. And oftentimes, I would say, unfortunately, there are many Muslims who do use it as an excuse. They do. They do use it as an excuse. And he who is enjoying the good and forbidden the evil or giving advice, he has a responsibility of gentleness, of wisdom, etc., right? But it doesn't mean that you can just pick and choose what haq you want to take just because a person presents it to you in a negative way. So the Prophet ﷺ was approached by many of his enemies and they said things that were true and he did what? He accepted it. And they only mentioned it to scorn him and the companions. But he still accepted the truth. He still took the truth. So there's always two sides to each coin now. You as the enlightened brother, you started praying, you start wearing your hijab, you started covering your hair, wearing loose clothes. You have a responsibility of being gentle, of being wise, not being judgmental, depending on the situation. Of using the natural close relationships, talking to your little sister, I'm your older sister, trust me, I'm your daughter, mother, follow me. Ibrahim as well. Mm -hmm. He said, oh my father, follow me. And he called him, yeah, apathy. All right? So all of those principles must be uh, employed by the one who's giving advice. Done. But that doesn't mean that you can reject the truth because it was brought to you in an ugly manner. And many people, they use this. And they keep feeding the stereotype and says, oh, religious people don't have any wisdom or they're too harsh or they're too this. Maybe they are, but it doesn't mean you can keep drinking. And a person clearly says that drinking is haram and he shows you the proof and evidence. It doesn't mean that you can reject the haq because it was brought to you in a bad fashion. To prove this point, Sheikh Muhammad Amin al-Shinqiti rahimahullah and his magnificent tafsir adwa al bayan fi tafsir al-Quran min quran he explains the concept of accepting the truth from whoever brings it and however it's brought. And he mentions this by a Quranic verse and by a line of poetry in Arabic. As far as the Quranic verse, then it's from Surah 2, uh, An-Naml, the ant. All right. Allah Azza wa Jal in the, this, uh, this Surah here, Surah 26, he talks about Suleiman, as we know, Solomon. And he also talks about the queen of... Uh, of, of, of that location Okay Of Ma'rib Her throne Bilqis They say Queen Sheba Alright We all know that Solomon was strong He was powerful He was educated He came from rich Noble blood Dawood uh, He was taught The language of birds Etc He had so much Allah gave him So much right And um, The Hudhud The Hopo It came back From Sheba And it told Suleiman uh, I found any wajat tumra tan tamlikuhum. Wootiat min kuli shay, walaha arshan azim. Wajatuha wakomaha, yes, to dun al shamsi min duni la al ayah. The hopo, the bird, Suleiman could understand this language. He said that I have found a woman owning or ruling these people. Tamlikuhum. Wootiat min kuli shay. And she's been given of all things a great dominion. Walaha arshan azim. And she had a grand throne. She's a powerful woman. All right. She's a queen. She has an army. She has a dominion. And I found that her and her people worship the sun. They make shirk with Allah. They prostrate to the sun besides Allah. And that shaitan has tricked them and deceived them, etc. Right? So Suleiman alayhi salatu wasalam, he gave the command and he gave the message. Who will bring me her throne before they are subjugated? Before they're made Muslims. 
some the human, the jinn, qala the the story of Suleiman and Asura, right? So uh Suleiman alayhi salatu wasalam he sent her a letter, right? And she says, Inni unqiya ilay kitabun kirim. Innuhu min Suleiman wa innuhu bismillah rahman rahim Allah uh he says the, the the queen she said that I've been given a letter from Solomon and it is a noble letter. And it commands us to submit, not to be haughty, and to to make ourselves Muslims to Suleiman, right? So what did what did this queen do? She sought the counsel. She sought uh, from her generals. Uh, they said we are very strong. We're formidable. We're, we're you know it's no joke. You have a serious army behind you. You want to fight Solomon? We'll fight him. You want to submit to him? Whatever you want to do. Wal amru ilayki. They said to her. So this queen, uh, she said, Inna al muluka. She said that these uh, muluk, these kings, when they enter a city, they ruin that city and they make the people of esteem and respect to be base, to be low. Allah says, And that is exactly what they do. In other words, the statement of Bilqis was a statement of what? Truth. It was confirmed by the Quran. So Sheikh Ashinqiti rahimahullah, he says that no one will reject a pearl because of the status of the diver. You wouldn't say, I'm not going to wear this mother of pearl necklace or watch or earrings because the diver was dirty or the diver was a kafir or the diver was a Muslim. Now Muslims, they drink coffee and those who founded the use of coffee were Muslims. And the people who hate Muslims, they hate Islam, but they what? They love coffee. So they don't reject the bean because of the one who picked the bean. So this is an extremely, uh, tremendously important Quranic lesson is that Bill and Keys spoke the truth. And at the time, she was a mushrika. She was worshiping the sun. And Allah confirmed her statement. And no one is going to say, don't give me the pearl because the diver was dirty and nasty. So therefore, you can't use it as an excuse. You're young. You're hasty. You were just smoking weed yesterday. And now you're telling me you can't use it as an excuse. You have to take the truth, even if the diver who brought the pearl was dirty. Or you don't like the person. So there's a responsibility on what? Both sides. And not too many people address both sides. They only focus on the religious people. They're supposed to be perfect. They're perfect humans. No, they're humans too. They make mistakes. They're not walking around as these great wise people. They have errors too. But your job is to hear the truth and accept it. And to thank the one who brought it to you. Even if they're trying to scorn you. Mm -hmm. I, I want to move on to another topic that... Um, that I feel that I would like to, I'd like to hear kind of your take on a kind of like the correctness of it and b the seriousness of it. It's a concept that's come up a few times uh, in recent times, kind of in front of me or around me, uh, and, and and that's why I want to speak to you about it. And this one's kind of more so for the men who are listening. Um, and so we were around the brother who basically said recently, uh, you know, we were all in conversation, and he mentioned he said that you know me and my wife we uh, we. You know we're very fair. We we make decisions together in the household, and um, especially when it comes to the children. Mm -hmm. But sometimes I have to kind of override a decision, and I explain to my wife. I say to her that um, when it comes to yom qiyamah, I'm going to be questioned about how I run my household and my family, and therefore. The way I see things and the way you see, see things can sometimes be a bit different because I'm seeing it from that perspective. Mm -hmm. And so I have to protect myself when I, because uh, I have to have my questions answered, right? So it's that concept of a man being questioned about his household, about the actions of his family and his household. Um, to, to, to what extent does that happen? And then um, how serious is that for the men listening? Clear. Uh, well, sometimes it's, it's his, his responsibility, it's his fault. He's going to be blamed, he's going to be rewarded or sin. A sinful four, no question about that. And there are other times in which that's beyond his reach. And that isn't his responsibility, and he is not blamed or uh, rewarded for things that his wife or his daughter or any woman does that lives in his household. Uh, and the, the answer to the question, we can just break it down and uh, look at it like this. In Islam, we have different levels. We have, let's talk about two terms. We have a mufti, and then we have a qadi, Right? So a mufti gives a fatwa He's asked about uh, a thing And he tells the ruling of Allah and his messenger He explains why a thing is permissible or impermissible, etc You want to take it, take it You thank the sheikh, jazakallah khairan You want to say that's stupid, that doesn't make any sense Get out of my face You don't know what you're talking about I don't have to do this It's not haram You can do that The qadi is a mufti 
Qadi gives a fatwa. This is the ruling of Allah and His Messenger in this issue. And the difference or the fork in the road between the Qadi and the Mufti is the Qadi lahu al-ilzam. He is now allowed to enforce that fatwa. He's allowed to enforce it and to put it into physical action. And he has been given the authority, he's been given the autonomy, etc. to actually implement Allah's ruling now. A mufti can't do that. He doesn't have the ilzam. He can't force anyone to take his view in his fatwa, whether it's correct or incorrect. But the qadi can. And when the qadi makes a ruling, you can't say, well, I'm not of that madhab. I don't follow that school of thought or that mode of thinking or that tradition. No. This is the ruling, this is the proof, and this mahkamah, done, over, finished. So look at it like that with regards to a husband or a father, someone who's young, someone who's older, uh, your wife versus your mother. Are you directly responsible for your wife? Do you give her advice? Do you tell her the fatwa? Or is it your job to make ilzam in which you're not allowed to live in my house dressed like this? You're not allowed. I won't be your husband. You're a free woman. We live in 2019 in America, freedom of religion, sure, but not in my house. So therefore, there's a huge difference between you forcing someone to follow the rules, whether they're convinced or not, versus someone who's at an age or a relationship once you don't have that power. And you're nothing more than a mufti. You tell your son, son, you can't drink. But he's grown. That's not the same as him being young, in which you have the physical ability to tulzimuhu, to force him, you cannot drink in my house. Outside, you can drink as much as you want, but not at my house. So I think many brothers, they uh, have a misunderstanding of this, this simple principle that she's a grown woman, she's a human being, but at the same time, she is your wife. You are responsible for her actions, but at the same time, you aren't. And that is because her heart is not in your hand. The Prophet ﷺ says that the hearts of the children of Adam are between the fingers of Ar-Rahman, and he turns them how he wants to. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. He turns them how he wants to. Alright? رَبَّنَا لَا تُزِيقْ قُلُوبَنَا بَعْدِ إِذْ هَدَيْتَنَا وَهَبْ لَنَا مِنْ لَدُنْكِ رَحْمَةً إِنَّكَ أَنْتَ الْوَهَابِ The believers, they say, لَا تُزِيقْ قُلُوبَنَا Don't sway our hearts. فَلَمَّا زَاغُوا أَزَاغَ اللَّهُ قُلُوبَهُمْ When they themselves turned away, Allah made their hearts sway. And it's verse after verse, hadith after hadith, that the heart is not in, it's not, you don't possess it. You don't control it. Allah controls it. All right? So with that being said, you can't convince someone to wear hijab. You can't convince a person that it's obligatory to cover the feet. You can't convince her that it's obligatory or best to wear niqab. You can't. You can give advice. You can teach. But if that woman is in a position or age or a time in which she says, you can't force me, you can't force her. But you being her husband and you being in that contractual agreement and you are her guardian, and you allow it and you live with it, now you're at fault. Because there is a certain level of ilzam that a husband does have. And there's a certain level of ilzam that a woman and a mother has. There's a certain level of ilzam that a teacher does have. I can't make you study at home, but I can force you to participate in the class. Because that is in the realm of my what? Or my realm of authority. All right? So you have to make a, a, a difference here. Um, I've given my wife advice. I can't control her. But there are certain things that you can do. And you as a husband must do. And we're not talking about you locking her up in a prison or nothing like that. But you have to tell her, listen, I can't stay in this relationship in which I have no respect and no authority. And you come and go as you wish and wish you please. I don't think it's, it's, it's not going to work for us. I can't stand in front of Allah on the day of judgment because I am responsible for you to a certain extent. That's, that's what I think should be said regarding that issue. Yes and no. Hopefully that's clear. I'm, I am conscious of your time There's a few uh, Kind of concepts That I wanted to discuss with you the, the, I think with the last episode That we did We, we discussed <coughs> Very very Jeez. specific matters mm -hmm. um, And so I wanted to Do the opposite with this one And discuss Very very general Broad. matters okay. And um, then uh, Another one that I wanted To touch upon Was the was the Akhirah And the concept of the Akhirah um, we, we discussed sins At the beginning of the episode and ultimately, the reason, or perhaps one of the things that will stop a person from committing sin is, is if they're constantly aware of and reflecting upon the akhirah. Mm -hmm. How can a person understand more of the akhirah, what's going to take place, of, and, 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 and how can he or she reflect on it more often? Clear. Juz Amma. Juz Amma. We know that the Prophet ﷺ had a specific... Way in mode of reciting in the prayers, all right. Um, with regards to the different types of surahs, the first seven surahs, 
after Fatiha, of course, the Sabah Tiwal, the seven long surahs. Then we have the Mufassal, Qisar Mufassal, the different categorization and the breakdown of how the Quran, the surahs are broken down with length and how many ayah, how many pauses are between each ayah. All right? So Surah Al Baqarah is one page, is an ayah. Ya ayyuhaladina amanu, the verse of the debt. That's the longest verse in the Quran. And there are verses about talaq, divorce, marriage, surah to nisa, inheritance, which is three, four lines. Four lines is one ayah. Verses, amma yatasa'alun, etc. Verses, walayli idha yagsha, washamsi wa duhaha. All right? Verses, uh, the different uh, ayat in juz amma, which are smaller and shorter in size, right? So we know that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in uh, the Maghrib prayer, Isha prayer, and the Fajr prayer, he would recite in general, certain surahs of a certain length. All right, now let's put that on pause for a second. Let's move to something else. Why is Maghrib prayer audible? Why is Isha prayer audible? Why is Fajr? Why do you even recite out loud? The scholars of Islam, they say, وَجَعَلْنَا اللَّيْلَ لِبَاسًا Allah says, وَجَعَلْنَا النَّهَارَ مَعَاشًا That we've made the daytime a means of livelihood. And the nighttime a cover, a screen, a means of rest. Second and uh, repose, serenity, sakina, right? So the scholars, they say that, uh, of course, there are people who work graveyard shifts and people who work at night. But the asal, the default, is that most people are up in the daytime working. And the default is that most people are resting and relaxing and sleeping at night, all right? So the time that maghrib comes in, the day is waning. You're finished work or you're about to finish work. Isha, the day is waning. The night should be pretty much, you know, coming to an end. Fajr, the day is beginning, but it's still dark. And you still haven't left out to go seek your rizq yet. So therefore, your heart is more attentive. Your ears are more open and you have a greater focus. And you don't have as much as a worry about getting back to work, rizq. But you're now 101% focused on the prayer. And that is why the prayer in those times is recited audibly. For you to listen and hear. And Dhuhr and Asr, in most cases, you're praying, giving Allah's haq, but it's back to work. I'm on my break. It's back to, to seeking Allah's provision and seeking his sustenance. So the point is what? Why did the Prophet ﷺ recite uh, many of those ayats and surahs from Juz Amma? Because Juz Amma is full of the akhirah. The very first surah to the very last surah in Juz Amma is talking about the akhirah, talking about the spirit, talking about the soul. And that was one of the biggest problems that they had with the Prophet ﷺ was resurrection. When we turn into dust and bones, when we turn into uh, dirt, uh, in now will we be brought back to a new resurrection? Khalq and Jadid, will we be resurrected? Allah, he mentions this. Tilka idin, karatun khasira. The, the mushrik, he said, that's a waste of time for us to die, turn into dust, turn into bones, and then be brought back to flesh and bones. That makes no sense. Allah Azza wa Jal, he mentions, It's nothing more but uh, the blowing of the trumpet. It's nothing more than a command is given, and they're what? Back to life. Just like that. So Juz Amma is full of resurrection. Resurrection. Paradise. Hellfire. It's full of the concept is that you're going to die, you're going to be raised up, and everything. It's any, an atom, an ant. A piece of grain, whatever you do of good or bad, you're going to see it. So I think that the Muslims on a daily basis should try their best to get a thorough and in-depth tafsir of Juzama. And keep reciting those surahs in the prayer, reflecting on those surahs, and what's meant by naziat gharqa. What's meant by that? إِذَا زُنْزِلَتِ الْأَرْضُ زِلْزَالَهَا Surah al adiyat that Allah on that day is Khabir, he's aware of everything that they do and everything that they had in their hearts. Is Allah not aware in the dunya? Maliki Omidin, does Allah not own every day? But there's no dispute or debate that Allah will be the ultimate sovereign and grand king on that day, and everyone will bear witness to that. So, the most harmful thing, as some other scholars of Islam have mentioned, is a lack of reflection upon the Quran. Hearing it, maybe memorizing it, listening to it, taraweeh. But they're not thinking about it. Mm. And if you're going to think about anything from the Quran, it should be that which you already know. And that is, in most cases, Juzama. Mm -hmm. That's what we were taught when we were younger. That's the first Jews that a Talib then memorizes it. And oftentimes, a brother memorizes Juzama. I'll give you a story of an imam in America. I won't mention his name for, for a few reasons. There's no problem. I just won't mention his name. 
um, he was one of the earlier graduates in the United States, one of the earlier graduates. Uh, and he got back to his city and his state. And of course, he had to deal with the older brothers, the older generations, those who served Islam, no doubt. They helped Islam become established. But oftentimes, they didn't have but so much knowledge. They did the best that they could. They did the best that they could. But unfortunately, when those who went overseas came back with the knowledge, they were a bit, you know, apprehensive against them. They were bench, you know, you know, like, what are you trying to come back and take our job? You're telling us we don't know anything, etc. And that wasn't the case. Human nature, right? Become territorial. Human nature. So, um, this this brother, he said, like, look, you know, uh, brothers, I'm not here to take your job. I'm not here to embarrass you or say that everything you're doing is wrong. But there are things that you have done and are doing that are wrong. And you guys have to be learned if you're going to be an imam of a community. So they challenged him. And they said certain things to him. And he had to use a bit of leverage on them. He asked them, how much Quran do you know? So this brother who was an imam, he's been an imam for 30 years. He may only know 10 surahs, 5 surahs, 6 surahs, here and there. A handful amount of surahs. And this brother, he had memorized much, much more of the Quran. But he said to them, he said, I know the entire Juz Amma. They said, you're lying. No, you don't. We don't believe you. He said, I can recite the whole Juz Amma from Surah Taneba to Surah Tanas right here in front of you. They said, get out of here. You're lying. We don't believe you. So the moral of the story is what? That's something that every Muslim is going to, who's trying to memorize the Quran is going to what? Start with. So if that's what most Muslims know, most Muslims are familiar with, the surahs that the Prophet used to recite in certain prayers like Fajr and Isha, it only makes sense to start off with the tafsir of those surahs. And most surahs, if not all surahs, are going to talk about what? The akhirah. Hell. Heaven. The grave. The punishment of Allah. The mercy of Allah. And that's something that you got to constantly reflect and remind yourself, I'm going to die. And death is not just R.I.P. Or as people say, see you in hell. Or hell's crowded. Or I'm going to get my revenge in hell. They think it's just some type of folly. You know, just, I right, see you. Now. That's not like that. The Muslim's aqeed is not like that. It's nothing like you can never, what? Liyawman azim. Allah says, a tremendous day. Yawman yuqumun nasun rabbil alameen. So reflecting on death is one of the main reasons behind righteousness. And it's one of the main reasons not, refi- not reflecting upon it is wickedness. And that's why Allah says, Wailun lil mutafifin. Woe to the cheaters. When it's their time to get measure, yastawfun. They get, I want every ounce, every kilo, every drop, every gram. Allah says, but when they give volume or measure to men, they cheat. Allah says, Don't these people know? Do they not think? Do they not have any idea that they will be resurrected? When and how will they be resurrected? Allah says, Liyawmin Azim, a tremendous day. The day in which all men will stand in front of Allah, the Lord of the worlds. I.e., in simplified terms, you're going to think about not cheating, not because you can't cheat, or you're not a good cheater, or I deserve more, you deserve less. No, I got to stand in front of Allah. So therefore, this is everything that you deserve, but more. I'll give you more of your measure. And for the only reason is that Allah is going to ask me about it. So reflection upon death makes you a better businessman. That's the simplified term. Reflecting on the day in which you stand in front of Allah, Liyom and Azim, is going to prevent you from cheating and doing the wrong thing. And if the Akhirah is in the back of your head, the back of your mind, inshallah, Allah will forgive. Allah is Kareem. Allah is Ghafoor Rahim. You know, Allah is not, you know, then let me take a little bit. Let me mm-hmm. get a little extra. Let me make my, my, the size of my donuts a little smaller now because you're good. You keep coming back buying donuts from me. No, 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 no. Donut size should get bigger. Because of Liyom and Azim. So the point is, is that reflection upon death, upon the hereafter, upon hell, and its diverse types of punishment has to have an effect on you. And this is one of the reasons why those pagan Arabs mistreated the orphans. And why they mistreated their slaves. And why they were so misogynic or they, why they why, um, treated women in such a horrible way. And why they were so racist and colorist and tribalist. And why they killed each other and fought each other because they... In here, illa hayat, it's only our hayat in the dunya. We die, and that's it, that's it. There's no resurrection, so why not get everything that we can get in this life? Live life to the fullest. You only live once, they say, right? Mm-hmm. If you got it, then flaunt it. Mm-hmm. But it's deeper than that. So when Muslims reflect on heaven and hell abundantly, it's going to have an effect on their lives. No doubt about that. A better husband, automatically. A better wife, 
I could curse you out. I could slap you, hit you. I can divorce you. I can mistreat you. But what? Allah. I got to I got to be asked and questioned about how I was as a husband. Okay? A woman. Why do I got to obey you? Obedience. That's a harsh word in 2019. Obey your husband. Seek your husband's permission. You're not doing it for your husband. You're doing it for Allah. And that's because Allah is going to ask you on the day of judgment about what he commanded you to do. And from what he commanded you to do is what's mentioned regarding the wife, regarding the husband, regarding students, teachers. I have a headache. I'm tired. I don't feel like teaching a class. But I'm going to be asked about it on the day of judgment. How did you treat the people? What did you do with the knowledge that I gave you? So the moment we reflect more on death and heaven and hell, it's going to have an immediate effect and impact on our lives as professionals and as people who have different relationships. That's what I think and feel and Allah knows best. Jazakallah khair, Sheikh. And uh, barakallah for um, uh, being on this podcast again, like I mentioned, for a second time. Uh, to end it, uh, the podcast, I'm going to very selfishly uh, ask you about a topic that uh, is prominent to myself, but perhaps will benefit those listening, and that's about fatherhood. Um, as I told you just just uh, off air, alhamdulillah, I've become a father, father for the first time just in the last nine days. Um, what would your advice be? Allahu Akbar. Uh, first and foremost is congratulations. Uh, some of the tabi'een, such as Hassan al-Basri and others, they would say when a child was born, Barakallahu uh, fi mawludik, may Allah bless your newborn. Uh, they would make dua such as, uh, uh, May you be given this good treatment. All right? Uh, may it reach its full age. And may you be thankful to the one who endowed you. The one who gave you that gift of the baby. And a baby brings all types of joy and pleasure. We all know this. So that's the dua that I make for you, first and foremost. And I say congratulations. Uh, obviously, I said, you know, I can't give you a cigar. Yeah. It's the custom of some American people. Mm -hmm. All right. We're just, you know, just saying that, you know. <laughs> all right. At the end of the day, um, my advice to you as a new father is to enjoy the moment. Cherish. Because before you know it, they're big. They're walking and they're talking. And before you know it, your son says, I don't need you to pick me up, Abby. I don't need you to walk me across the street. I got it, Abby. I can tie my own shoes. Before you know it, they're teenagers. And they develop their own personalities. They have their own characteristics. And oftentimes, the one, I mean, this is deep, if you ask me. Like, you know, you were inseparable. Little girl, daddy's girl, mama's boy. But the moment it turns into teenagers, they want to go outside the house. I'll be back, Abby. I'll be back, Umi. They want to hang out. They want to have fun with their children. I'm not talking about haram stuff. They want to be teenagers. And this is one of the most difficult transitional stages for parents. It's to accept the fact that it's no longer a little boy. He's a grown man now. She's no longer a little girl. You can't take her to the park and buy her ice cream cone and throw a frisbee with her. That doesn't entertain her anymore. And the father is heartbroken like, you don't want to go to the park with me? She says, no, Abby. I want to go to the masjid. It's a henna party. I want to go with sister such and such house. Like, Every Sunday, this is what we used to do. And so you were just... I'm not longer, I'm not yay high anymore. Mm -hmm. So cherish the moment. Children grow fast. They grow rapidly. Enjoy Allah's blessing. Be happy. Be joyful. And just spend as much time as you can with your son. As much time. And all of the positivity that you put into the relationship, you're going to get back. In this life, and inshallah, most importantly in hereafter, is when you die. And hopefully, inshallah, your son will live after you and pray for you. So enjoy the moment, cherish the moment, be happy, and of course, fulfill the sunnah rites, the akinka, the naming, the shaving of the head, and most importantly is the good tarbiyah. And all of the money, the time that you invest in your children, I am a firm believer, wallah, you're going to get back. Every single ounce of it, you're going to get back. Physically, materially, and also spiritually. So just enjoy the moment, have fun with your son, and just teach him. Show him how to be a Muslim man. And of course, inshallah, you have more children. You build a Muslim family in, and you increase the number of the Muslims. And most importantly is, last piece of advice, uh, something that I mentioned in the lecture that we just did, and I'm not saying this is your case, but just a general rule. Some people who grow up, and they may have been, I'm not saying this is about you, mistreated by their parents, right? Or they weren't mistreated, but their parents lacked it, their, their parents lacked empathy or sympathy. They, they, I've had people come to me, literally, Achi, from many cultures, and they say, I've never heard my mother or father say they love me, not once. Okay, I was in uh, California a couple weeks back, and we were talking about beatings and physical discipline in the masjid. So I said to one brother, he was from a country, I won't mention a country, I said, where I'm from, your mother would beat you, and she'd tell you, don't cry, I'm doing this because I love you. 
I'm beating you because I love you. Me disciplining you is a means of love. So this brother, he said, he said, I wish my mother told me that. <laughs> he said, my father never ever told me that. He would just beat me. And that was it. And then another brother who's from the same ethnicity, he chipped in. He says, yeah, such and such type of parents. He says, they never ever tell their children that they love them, ever. And then a third brother came. We were eating lunch. Uh, and he said, this is a big problem in our culture. People grow up and they don't know how to love they don't know how to give to their children because their parents never taught it to them. So with that being said, uh, you have to have a vendetta. If you weren't given that love and that affection and that good, rich, quality time, go against it and say, I'm going to do the opposite with my son. I'm going to take my son to the park. I'm going to buy him ice cream. I'm going to throw a softball at him. I'm going to buy him his first this. I'm going to be there the first time he makes a lot. I'm going to be there his first word, his first step. I'm going to take him to the masjid for the first time. My son is going to go to Juma from a young age. And not like my father who never took me to the masjid. So I'm not saying that this is the case with you. But advice for any listener is that if you didn't get what you were supposed to get of a child, that's fine. Allah is just. And Allah, he gives you a, a chance to fix the wrong. You weren't given that love. Now you have a son. Bismillah. Your mother didn't raise you properly as a, as a woman. She taught you bad ways, unfortunately. Now it's time to raise your Aisha. And your Emma to Allah as a righteous Muslim woman from what? From day one. And that starts with cherishing the moment, thanking Allah for the blessing, and making sure that it's now, you, you have to realize that it's your turn. And Allah, He mentions this in the Quran, is that He gives us succession in the land. He gives us succession. Meaning, this was a bad leader, the leader is gone. You're the leader. What are you going to do now? You're the father now. You're the emir. You're the head honcho in the household. How are you going to do it? How are you going to raise your son? And what wrongs and ills can you now fix and reverse because you have the wheels of authority now. That's That That would be my advice to you or for anybody else. And most importantly, enjoy. Jazakallah khair. Barakallah feek, Sheikh. I really appreciate you coming down. And uh, I won't take any more of your time. Jazakallah khair. Thank you very much. May Allah bless you. Bless all the watchers. Jazakallah khair.